All right, more follow up to all of the NVIDIA new GPU information. And this one is gonna be focusing on DLSS 3, as well as some more information about SER, OMM, DMM, and a bit more. Now where I'm getting this, cause again, I'm not at GTC where all of this is being, uh, you know, given to the press. I have been following articles about all of this extremely closely and you can watch my last few videos, all of that, um, to try to get the juiciest, most interesting interesting bits of information out to you. Now, this is a WCCF tech article. All my links will be in the description like usual to my sources. And they asked some follow-up questions to NVIDIA and they did get some responses about some specific little technical details about these. And if you're not sure what these things even refer to, well, let's dive in and I'll try to explain that a little bit as we go. And then there'll also be a whole bunch of little small news, uh, or news stuff after this main event. So basically, let's take a look at the questions that they answered, and then I'll explain some of the context as needed. So first, they're asking about shader execution reordering. And this is one of the new features in um, this uh, new GPU announcement. So let's actually talk about that a little bit more. So what actually is shader execution reordering? So shader execution uh, reordering is basically saying in a ray traced game, some rays hit different areas of the scene, uh, then they won't be able to run the same program. They'll be calculating different things. They're hitting different areas of the, uh, of the scene and therefore will have to sit idle while the first ray is finishing. So we're talking about the efficiency of calculating ray tracing, getting kind of bottlenecked by having to wait for another ray while certain other things are happening. And what SER does, it's called shader execution reordering, is it helps by adding a new stage into the ray tracing pipeline where rays that should run on the same program are grouped together and this can gain efficiency. And they've got this little graph where they try to, uh, ah, make myself tiny here so I'm out of the way, where they kind of try to show off um, the difference here, right? With, with SER, they, they're trying to regroup things to work better. Basically allows it to be a more parallel process and not waste time and you can gain efficiency. And NVIDIA has claimed that SER enables significant performance boosts in Cyberpunk 2077's new, which we can't do yet, but will be released publicly eventually, ray tracing overdrive mode, which is more than turning on all the current ray tracing that the game launched with. Um, by 44%, their Portal RTX they showed off boosts performance by 29%, and in their Racer RTX de demo by 20%. So that's what SER is. Now, what is the follow-up question? The follow-up question is asking, okay, so they said there's an extension in the NVIDIA API that developers can use to optimize shader execution reordering for their games. So does that mean that SER will need to be optimized to give any performance advantage? Or is there still an algorithm to slightly improve shader execution reordering automatically? So basically what they're asking is, this sounds great. We saw these claims of some massive performance boosts um, in these other games, but do developers have to go back and turn this on? Do they have to actually code this into their game or does your GPU and driver do some of this and get at least some performance gain in older games that don't go back and recode for this feature? I think that's what this is asking. And their answer is, SER must be enabled specifically by the developer. These changes are usually quite modest, sometimes just a few lines of code. We expect this feature to be easily adopted. So basically, this will be very easy to add into games so a lot of new games will probably put it in, but I think there's a question of how many old games would bother to go back and do that to gain this um, ray tracing performance advantage for the new, uh, the new GPUs. And I would say some developers probably just won't bother going back to update that, even if it's just a few lines of code, but it sounds like they're gonna push it on uh, you know, newer games. Now, the other thing is, similarly, will other tech advances like DMM, Displaced Micro Mesh, and OMM, Opacity Micro Maps, require explicit developer optimization? Now, some of you are probably like, what does any of those a DMM and OMM actually mean? 
Um, let me tell you a little bit more about that. So they've got this little, uh, you know, graphic here for you to take a look at. So um, showing off the difference between Ampere and Ada and trying to show off the dis DMM, Displaced Micro Meshes. And um, they also have OMM where they're trying to show this off. Uh, in, in this is a portal example. But what actually is it? What is this doing? So here's how they explain it. So um, the Ada Lovelace architecture as a whole is displaced micro meshes. Um, so it's, it's an intro innovation introduced to this architecture as a whole. So all the Ada Lovelace GPUs should have this. And it says it's targeted ray tracing optimization for geometry. So it's another ray tracing, ray tracing ah, optimization. And it says the new third generation RT core, so that's the one in the new Ada Lovelace GPUs, is capable of understanding and processing an optimized BVH, bounding volume, volume hierarchy. And so as such, BVH build performance is improved and storage requirements are decreased. Okay, so, um, and it says that displaced micro meshes will be supported by both SimplyGon and Adobe Tools. So basically it's a ray tracing optimization and it's um, related to bounding volume hierarchy. And I'm guessing for most of us, none of those details matter too much. It's just a ray tracing optimization and opacity micro maps are again, a ray tracing optimization. They make it easier for RT cores to understand how irregular objects should be affected by rays. That's achieved through opacity masks that include predetermined opacity states like translucent, opaque, or unknown. And as such, OMMs can save a trip back to the, the streaming multiprocessors and improve performance. In this portal example, it's improving performance by 10%. So that's interesting, that's good, but then we return to this follow-up question. Will DMM and OMM require explicit developer optimization or will older games that are not updated or coded for this just automatically get a performance boost on the new GPUs? That's what this is asking. And we are answered with both OMMs and DMMs require explicit integration into the game engine. So this is not just gonna automatically be boosted in old games that were not programmed in this way. So with that comes some modification and transformation of game assets. We intend to share best practices for fully leveraging both features via our developer blog. So notice that this one didn't just say, it's just a few lines of code. This says there's modification transformation of game assets required and, and you know explicit integration into the game engine. So I will take this as future games will be programmed with this in mind and so then the Lovelace uh, GPUs will have an advantage there, but older games that weren't programmed with this in mind, this does not sound like a simple and easy update with just a few lines of code. The next question is regarding DLSS 2. So uh, their question is, as far as I understand, uh, sorry, DLSS 3. DLSS 2 games only need the addition of reflex markers on the developer side to make them DLSS 3 compatible. Is that correct? In other words, um, can games that have DLSS 2 already just implement uh, Reflex and then be compatible with DLSS 3? If so, how many hours of manpower do you expect that would take on average? In other words, they're getting at how easy is it for DLSS 2 games to be updated to DLSS 3 games? It says, you're correct, DLSS 3 combines super resolution. That's what DLSS 2 is no known for, where you render the game at a lower re resolution, it jitters it, it uh, uses temporal motion vectors, color data, things like that, and then outputs an image that looks more like a higher resolution image, but doesn't take you as long to render the frame, increasing frame rate. Um, it combines that, that's what DLSS 2 does, and frame generation, watch my last couple of videos talking about DLSS 3 if you want more idea of that, but they predict a frame to happen in between two other frames, but it doesn't need to fully render the, the final frame to kind of predict that one. Uh, anyway, it inserts AI, you know, it inserts frames that the game engine isn't really rendering. Um, which is really interesting, look at my other videos, and NVIDIA Reflex is part of this. And I think the reason they, they're tying Reflex into DLSS 3 is that frame generation increases latency and Reflex subtracts latency, and so that should solve that problem, basically. 
Now, if a game already has DLSS 2 super resolution, upgrading to DLSS 3 is a very simple process and will make both super resolution and frame generation available. So they're saying this should be a very simple upgrade from DLSS 2 to DLSS 3. Uh, it says, now this is also interesting. DLSS 3 is designed for fast and easy integration. It's already one of the fastest NVIDIA technologies to be adopted, so it's already being picked up quick. And DLSS 3 leverages the same integration points as DLSS 2. So to integrate it into your engine, you just need access to the color buffer, depth bu buffer, engine motion vectors, and output buffers, and NVIDIA reflex. So Basically, these are all the things that DLSS 2 needed. DLSS 3 also requires NVIDIA Reflex, again, to deal with that latency issue. Making upgrades from these existing SDKs easy via our DLSS Streamline plugin. Now, here's the other thing. You might guys might be like, well, couldn't you just use NVIDIA Reflex with DLSS 2 and not use the frame generation and get lower latency overall? Um, in other words, can you turn off the frame generation, but still use Reflex and DLSS 2? Um, interesting question, we'll address it here, but I do want to mention that they did say DLSS 3 is coming to the world's most popular game engines, so it's coming to Unity, Unreal Engine, and Frostbite Engine, so it'll be easy for games built on those engines um, to add in DLSS 3. Now, um, they're addressing one commonly mentioned NVIDIA DLSS 2 shortcoming is motion sharpening. Has this been addressed with DLSS 3? And also, will you endeavor to push game developers to always expose sharpness sliders in the graphics options? This is something many users would like to see. So a lot of people feel like DLSS looks over sharpened or under sharpened. Some games give you a slider for, to adjust that yourself. Some games don't. They're asking, is NVIDIA going to push developers to require the sharpness slider? Um, and they, their response is, we are always working to improve the image and motion quality of DLSS super resolution, but don't have any specific announcements about motion sharpening at this time. They say they encourage game developers to expose the sharpness sliders um, because they know those preferences vary, but they don't require. They encourage, they don't require. Okay, now here's where we're getting the latency issue again. So further follow-ups on my last couple videos discussing that. So they said esports users who might want to achieve the lowest latency, um, will it be possible to only enable DLSS 2 or maybe call it 3 but just use the super resolution with reflex but turn off the frame generation since even though that increases your frame rate, it also increases your latency. Usually increasing frame rate decreases latency. Um, but in this case, that wouldn't be the case because these frame generation frames aren't actually rendered by the engine, so you can't interact with them, if that makes sense. Um, and they said that that would improve FPS, but also increase system latency, right? Because of, because of the frame generation. Now, this is interesting. So he says, our guidelines for DLSS 3 encourage developers to expose both a master DLSS on off switch as well as individual feature toggles for frame generation, super resolution, and reflex. Now notice he uses the word encourage, not require. So it sounds like a lot of games, but maybe not all of them, will allow you to choose whether you want the frame generation or not. Because I think in competitive esports games, you could use DLSS super resolution, which is like DLSS 2.0, to increase your frame rate, and those are real frames, so that does decrease your latency. And don't tell me it doesn't, this has been, I know some people argue about DLSS 2 increasing latency. The tests I have seen show that you increase your frame rate, they're real frames that you can interact with, and that decreases the time between frames, so it decreases your latency. Um, so you could turn that on with Reflex, which also decreases your latency, but keep frame generation off. That would be what, you know, in a competitive game you'd probably want to do. But in a single player game, if your latency is low enough, uh, the frame generation, if its image quality is good, because that's the other thing, we have to see if the image quality is good. Because if it's not good, you might want to turn it off for image quality reasons. If it does look good, you might want to leave it on on single player games and turn it off on competitive games, right? Uh, so it looks like they're encouraging developers to allow that, but not requiring it. And it says, note that while DLSS frame generation can add roughly, and this is interesting, so how much latency does it add? Roughly half a frame of latency. Now, frames 
don't ta all take the same amount of time. The faster your frame rate, the less time a frame is. So the higher your frame rates are, the less latency this will introduce. So that's good news if you're running like an eSports title at, or, or you know any game at a high frame rate. Um, which the super resolution aspect helps you do anyway. So I don't think this is gonna be a huge amount of latency that it's added, adding. Anyway, uh, this latency is often uh, mitigated by NVIDIA Reflex and DLSS super resolution, but they're acknowledging that you, if you turn those, you know, they're not really saying it, but if you turn those two on together without frame generation, you would have lower latency. You would, you would regain that half frame of latency back. All part of the DLSS3 package, NVIDIA Reflex reduces latency by synchronizing CPU and GPU, and DLSS Super Resolution reduces latency by decreasing the size of the render resolution. Anyway, that's pretty much what I want to say about that. Now, a few last little bits of news. One is that Seasonic is announcing a new power supply that conforms with ATX 3.0 and PCIe 5.0 standards. So if you wanted to get one of these power supplies, you wouldn't need that adapter that comes with the new GPUs to plug in your eight pin connectors to the new connector. This would just have the new connector. Although uh, prices are not cheap and the availability isn't until mid-December. Uh, which means you can't buy one at the exact card launch date. Um, NVIDIA is releasing GeForce Experience Update 3.26 uh, Beta, which supports RTX 40 series, and it looks like it also is solving some, um, uh, some bugs. So there were some bugs going on with some others, um, uh, other games, and, and uh, you know, I, I think there was some kind of like stuttering issue. Uh, and some builds of windows and things like that. Anyway, this is, yeah, apparently solving those problems. You might want to look into getting that. Um, Intel had promised to launch their GPUs in the summer, and they didn't. Summer's over now if you check the date. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, Spider-Man Miles Morales PC trailer, because we got the Spider-Man game, but it didn't have the Miles Morales version. Uh, the trailer um, uh, is out, and it's a fall 2022 release confirmed, so that should be coming soon. Uh, the Modern Warfare 2 beta on Steam brought in nearly 110,000 concurrent players. I was one of them, and I've already published at least one benchmark by the time you see this video, and I may get others out, I may not. I'm gonna be very busy this weekend. Um, Cyberpunk 2077 has a new mod, so not an official update, but a new mod that unlocks additional graphic settings to boost performance on weaker systems. So if you're gonna do the opposite of the overdrive mode, if you've got a weak GPU, uh, you might look into this if you wanna decrease the settings to play on a low spec PC. And the uh, Core i9-13900K Raptor Lake's premium packaging design leaks out. If you're unaware, the i9 top-end Intel chips have a history of interesting packaging. Um, like the, uh, you know, what is that, icosahedron? Is that, I, I'm, I am a geometry teacher, I, I should know that. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, the, uh, now I'm doubting myself. That's a dodecahedron, isn't it? Dodec. 2 and 10, 12 sides, that's 12 sides, whatever guys. Anyway, I don't know, I'm not a math guy. I just teach it. Now anyway, <laughs> uh, he here's the uh, new i9 packaging. To me, honestly, that looks a lot less exciting. It looks like it's designed to decrease space requirements, which is nice for a variety of efficiency and packaging and environmental reasons. But anyway, I hope all of you have an excellent day.